80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pop rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose hey what's cracking youtube it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation y'all down y'all you know what it is man it's interview time i got a friend of mine good brother that i did some time with uh known as boxer and so uh go ahead boxer introduce yourself what's up man this is your boy boxer log bx everybody know Boxer, so uh, to give us a little background about yourself, tell us uh, basically what year you was born, and so that way we can give the uh, the, the, the people that's listening an idea of what time you grew up in and, and where you grew up at and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so I was born in 72, um, 51, about to be 52 years old. And, uh, you know, I come up in the 70s going into – the 80s, you know, as a teenager, um, I grew up as a youngster. I grew up like on the east side of L.A. And then as I right after like 12 years old, um, I moved into South Central L.A., 71st and Dinker. You know, uh, down the street from Florence and Normandy, where the riots took place. Uh, that's where I grew up at. Okay, and so when you when you grew up on the east side initially, um, are you the oldest? Uh, where do you fall? You know, do you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah, um, I do have brothers and sisters. Um, my family backing is is like an obstacle. Uh, when I was born, my mom was 19 years old. She was running the streets. Okay. And uh, the guy that she was with, um, she was real close to his sister, um, which ended up being a very key piece in my life and ended up being my mom. Okay. Her and her husband as my dad. Um, as I got older, um, going back and forth with, my mom and dad, um, you know, we moved around. But then, like I said, by the time I got 12 years old, we moved right there on 71st and Dinker. So by, by the time you got 12, that was probably about 83. And, and so. Um, oh, 84. 80, yeah, okay, 84. So I know yeah. the L.A. gang life at that point in time was up and running, you know. So when did you first. As far as you can remember, when did you first notice, you know, whether it was on the east side or on the west side, when did you first notice, you know, the gangs, the Crips and Bloods and, and that type of stuff? Well, my family um, came up around uh, Jamel, his uh, family member, you know, and uh, a lot of other OG cats when it was just you know, east side, west side Crips, you know what I'm saying? I got that in my ear, you know? And uh, so I was uh, exposed to it at a young age, but it never was no running around talking about cuz, never running around talking about no blood, none of that, right. um, until I moved over on that end, you know? And And so for those listening who may not know who Jamel is, can you... Can you elaborate a little bit further? Let everybody know who, who Jamel is. Jamel used to run with Tookie. You know, then was 
the big old, big old guys. Jamel come up off that east side, you know, Avalon Gardens over that way, 8-8, eight, eight, you know. And uh, him and, you know, Tookie ran together. And, uh, you know, cats that been around, they, they know Jamel. So you talk, you're talking about Jamel Barnes, right? Yes, sir. And so uh, once you moved to the west side when you was around 12, um, did you become more involved in the gang life? Oh, most definitely. Uh, when I moved over that way, I was starting seventh grade. And uh, I went, that was junior high, and I went to Horseman. Uh, Horseman Junior High, um, it's only really two hoods that go there. And that's the eight Trey Gangsters and the Rolling Sixties, and uh, you know um, that was a a very crazy experience in itself, you know. And so, when you guys moved to the West Side, was your neighborhoods controlled by a certain gang? Yes, eight Trey Gangsters, um, the Florence and Normandy era, where the riots started. Seventy um, first and Dinker is only like two blocks from there. The block I grew up on, 71st, 71 ended up being the block, you know. So it was a lot of us all around the same age right there uh, on that block. And uh, going to Horse Man, we all walk in that way. If you left out that front part of the school and walk towards Western, then everybody know mostly that you hang with the A-Trays, you know. So all my friends some of them banged already you know what i'm saying and uh it wasn't until later after school right there off of florence and west and burger palace everybody used to go after school and hang out and stuff like that you know what i'm saying and uh sometime the six o's would be up in there but it was on our side of western you know what i'm saying so uh they know we'd be there deep uh, it's on the north. And uh, one day I'm there with some homies and uh, the cats didn't even get out. They came right down Florence going towards Crenshaw and they just let off right there and, you know, shot the place up. The way Burger Palace is built, though, it got bricks from the sidewalk to about halfway up then his big old windows you know what i'm saying so didn't nobody get shot in there just the glass broke and everybody up under the tables and everything and you know this is my first time ever going through this about how you old know. were you at that time uh i was 13 man 13 so and, and this is uh this is after already going there for one year seventh grade now i'm in the eighth grade Right. So, you know. already, so already at the young age of 13, you're being introduced to guns and I mean, well, gunshots being shot at and that type of stuff. Right. And then for a small background story, once again, for those who are not familiar with the L.A. gang culture and the landscaping of L.A., you said by the time you moved in this neighborhood, um, it was controlled by two gangs, the A-Trays and the Rolling Sixties. For those of you guys who may not know, by that time, there was a, a feud that had been going on several years between the A-Trays and the 60s and as it is a lot of times with a lot of gangs at one point in time the a trades in the 60s were uh were good friends you know and then a beef happened unfortunately somebody lost their life and it started a feud which still goes on today a very 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 long feud a lot of people will say uh the first crip on crip feud between crips was was the a trades in the 60s so your mother moved to an area where all this is going on and and so now you are hanging with the a trades right Yes. Yes, sir. And so how was it? How was it? How was it like back then? Right. You know, because box <coughs> for a lot of people who are, you know, um, being introduced to the gang banging culture through YouTube and social media or maybe in the last five or 10 or 15 years, you know, it was extremely different back then. I call that traditional gang banging where, you know, uh, Crips didn't wear blood. Um, excuse me. Crips didn't wear red. Bloods didn't wear blue. And so it was a very, very crazy time. What was it like growing up, you know, during that time in, in that in that well-known beef? Well, um, the block I grew up on, 71st, um, became 7-1 Hustlers. Um, so rock cocaine that came into play, 
Um, I seen the battle ram and all that come around. People that don't know, it was like an armored tank that would go and kick in dope houses. You know what I'm saying? Smash the whole front door in. You know, so I grew up around that area when uh, you had Nissan trucks on center lines. Uh, Dayton's and all that wasn't wasn't out like that then. Uh, you had laces and Vobes. You know, uh, somebody had like a 38, 357, then that was something. Uh, 12 gauge was something. You didn't have like all these nines and and very, very few times would you ever hear about a Uzi. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wasn't strapped like that back then. It was more so, uh, it was some shooting, but it'd be, you know, you get them up. You know, go from the shoulders. Uh, it wasn't all this drive-by shooting and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> but it was dangerous, very dangerous. And so initially, the schools that you were attending, they were attended by both um, Rolling Sixties and and uh, the A Trays, the gang that you ran with. And and so, like you said, it would be a lot of initially there was a lot of fist fighting and stuff. Oh yeah, most definitely. And horseman, uh, one year we might be deep. Next year, they might be deep. Are we both deep at the same time? And, uh, you know, it get cracking back by the bungalows and all that stuff, you know? And so, as it is a lot of times when, you know, <coughs> you have two gangs that's feuding and they grew up, <coughs> and they grew up within close proximity of each other, a lot of times you have, Dudes who happen to be friends growing up, and then maybe one would join one gang, one would join another gang. Did you happen to have any friends who who ended up being from Rolling Sixties? Any close friends? Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, it's a few cats that uh, when I first went to Horseman, uh, ne neither one of us uh, was like that with the gangs, and like I said, by time. I hit eighth grade and all that and really fell into place with that. Um, I seen some of the same guys I grew up with. And now it's just like the stare off. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I've been in the pen with some of these cats uh, through juvenile hall. We never got into it with each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because we had that uh, relationship in, in the beginning as kids. You know what I'm saying? Uh, learning this, seeing this. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, when you got um, a street that separates the two, um, you had that, you know, they grew up on that side. I grew up on this side. And that's what I was going to ask you to explain that once again, because you have a lot of people that's not knowledgeable or don't quite understand how close you guys live to the people that you're feuding with. And so, as you mentioned, sometimes it's just a street that separates, right? One from one sidewalk across to the next, you know, that's how close uh, the A trays and six O's are. Is that close, you know? And once again, I don't think I can re reiterate this enough. There has been many, 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 many lives eventually lost in this war between the A trays and the 60s. So, this was a very extremely um, violent, you know, violent war. So, what was it like later on once you said? the fighting stopped and then the guns kicked in and the shooting became going back and forth on both sides. You know, what was it like if you ever happened to see somebody who back in the days you were friends with, and now you guys were from opposing gangs, would you give them what we call a pass back then? Or what was that like? I've done that. Uh, like I said, uh, it's a few cats that I went to school with that I seen and, uh, you know, gave them that, you know, just because of, the, you know, uh, young relationship that we had as kids coming up in them street. And it's been vice versa to where I didn't see them push up on me sometime, you know, and uh, it was that like, man, come on, box, man. I can't keep doing this. You know what I'm saying? And uh, but I never had nobody that I knew as a child ever shoot at me. And so you mentioned that your hood was literally like two blocks from where the riots took place, the LA riots back in, what was that? 91, 92? 92. 
the exact year. Uh, were you were you free and were you present for that? No, I just went to jail for passing. Uh -huh. And uh, but I was at the time I was in Supermax. And so I seen it on TV, you know. And so for those out there who may not be familiar, when the riot jumped off, you had a real famous scene where the guy was snatched out of a, a diesel. And uh, that was right in your hood, right? Yes, sir. All my homies is right there. Reginald Denny. So you knew a lot of those guys who uh, who was on camera who got who got caught up in that situation? Yes, sir. At that time, you was locked up, getting ready to head to head to prison for the first time for passing. So for those out there who may not understand that terminology, can you break that down? What what sent you to prison for the first time? Uh, passing. I just, you know, hit a leg um, on the jury leg and got caught, you know, three months later. And so initially, how much time were you facing when you were sent to prison for the first time? And how old were you? Well, they gave me uh, seven years with half time. You know, back then they was giving up half time. Um, I ended up doing almost five years, you know, four and some change, like four and eight. And so how and I was, uh, uh, when I first went, I was uh, 19 and uh, I got sentenced right after I turned 20. And so if they was giving up halftime and you got seven years and you had to do three and a half, why, why did you bring five? What, what ended up happening? Well, uh, this was my first time in a pen and I had been laced by older homies on how things are, how things can be, um, what to expect, um, how you should carry yourself and stuff like that. So uh, I end up going to Roscoe State Prison mm -hmm. and uh, the reception center. To so mm -hmm. while I was there, um, I asked, you know, let me stay here since I have level three points and go to the main line, hey, yard. And a couple of months went by and uh, they sent me to a yard. I go to a yard and uh, I don't know how they do it. Now, but back then we used to have to stay on orientation for a whole week before they let you out to GP. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, you know, it was a few homies on the line, you know, like about eight, nine homies. And uh, it was a situation that went down with a dude um, that had something to do with uh some of my homies getting life sentences, you know, um, without going into full detail on that, because I don't know homie situations and stuff like that. And I don't want to speak on some that can jeopardize whatever they might have. Right. So I'm going to say, uh, you know, this cat, uh, supposedly had spoke on that situation on the stand like that. And, uh, one of the homies was supposed to deal with him and stuff like that. But, he was kind of showed to the house, so he was stagnant on it. And I end up falling on the line right while all that was going on. And so uh only thing I could think of is he not finna be on the line with me. You know what I'm saying? And so uh the same day I got off of orientation, uh is the same day I end up catching a conspiracy to commit murder and ended up in Pelican Bay shoot. 20 years old so basically the first day you hit the yard you hit the general population you end up uh i'm assuming catching a start a, a stabbing charge and going to the shoe yes sir wow and so um uh, man around 19 to 20 years old you know I, i'm i'm thinking that was right around the time that pelican bay had just had just opened pelican bay has all always had a notorious name um, it's been a notorious prison. So what was that like for you as a 19 year old, 20 year old, <coughs> knowing that you initially came to prison with seven years and you had level three points, but now suddenly you're facing a, a conspiracy to murder. You're in the shoe in Pelican Bay. What, what was that like? OK, so when I caught that case, uh, they had asked me, you want to go to Corcoran or you want to go to Pelican Bay? And I'm trying to be that hard here. 
send me to Pelican Bay. You know, uh, I ain't knowing what to expect, but I'm just like, shoot, that's the place that um, being talked about is fresh. It had just opened in 89, and here I am going to the shoe in 92. So it was fresh. Uh, I ended up doing 25 months uh, in the shoe, C10 back then, and uh, ended up getting out and went to be yard. And once again, for those out there who may not know, although I'm, I'm, I'm assuming most people know you're from the same hood that uh, Monster Cody is from, right? Most definitely North. And so did you happen, was, was he, was he in Pelican Bay at the hole in the hole at that time? Did you happen to run across at, him? Yeah. At that time, uh, I just so happened to go to law library, uh, one day and, uh, how Pelican Bay was back then, uh, they did escorts, uh, but you'd be spread out. But when you go to the law library, it used to be like little booths, you know, that everybody would sit at with an iron cage door. So the only time you could really see somebody there is if you going, you know, to your booth or something like that. And I just so happened to run into Monster. And back then he was in C3, you know. Uh-huh. And so a lot of people may not know your hood is actually broken down into different parts. So you have the north side A trays, you have the west side A trays, so on and so forth. Like you said, Monster Cody happens to be from the north. So you guys are from the same hood and from the same side. Had you encountered him before on the streets, before you ran across him in Pelican Bay? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't meet Monster until later on down the line as I got older. By you guys both being in the shoe, I, um, I'm sure he, you guys wasn't able to talk as much as you would like to talk. Was he able, by you being a youngster at that time, was he able to give you any guidance on doing time? Or um, what was your interactions with him like in, in Pelican Bay? Uh, it wasn't no guidance given. Uh, wasn't having time for that. And them guards wasn't having it, you know. Uh, and you wasn't going to do nothing to jeopardize, jeopardize what you was uh, going there for and all that too but uh at that time he had that book out you know he had that book out at that time so uh you know it was read talked about and stuff like that so i kind of had an idea of where he was and then with his name ringing bells back then anyway you know what i'm saying i kind of knew where he was at and so what was it like being in the shoe for 25 months can you describe like what life was like on a daily basis for you inside the shoe okay so back then in the shoe um you could have your tv in there and you know uh, a lot of people watch bt big brother and all that back then you know uh the way i was brought up uh my parents was very, very into being activists, you know, um, for our race and um, friends with the Black Panthers and all that. So um, I used to get books sent in to me and, you know, so my ideology and, and knowledge that's being directed to me is totally different. Um, while other cats was watching BET, um, I'm writing, you know, I'm writing my music, I'm writing scripts and stuff like that. Um, I'm work. My, my discipline is totally different. And then, like I said, I'm in a foreign place. We talking about solitary confinement, you know? So this was something new for me, but in my head, all I used to always think of, I'm not about to let them break me. And I seen cats talking about the walls is closing in and dudes is losing their mind back there, you know. Uh, but I'm faced with a total different thing in life, so my understanding about things is totally different. So describe for people who've never been to the shoe what was life like back then? How often did you come out of the cell? Uh, it was 23 hours you in that cell and an hour you come out. Um, you did have your shower time, but 
showers back then was three minute showers. Like you go in there and do a Michael Jackson, spin around and soap off and rinse off all in one, you know, um, shave and all that. You know, they weren't allowing you to be in there like that. Um, I went to yard, um, whether it was cold or what, it, it, it didn't matter. Um, I had to come out and get that. And back there, um, the way it's built, um, you had a lot of acoustics and stuff like that. So me um, doing them raps and all that stuff, I used all that to my advantage. And so during my whole time, I never really felt like I was in prison because I let my creative writing and the books and stuff that I was receiving and reading um, set me elsewhere. So if you can recall, can you tell us some of the books that you were being sent or some of your favorite books? Um, Vision, Vision for the Black Man. Um, listening with the third ear. Um, listening with the third eye. Um, a lot of books. And I, ca I can't even remember all the names, you know. Right. And then, uh, you know, I don't know. It's been so long ago, you know. And so after your 25 months in the shoe was up, what was it like to finally be released to general population in Pelican Bay? And then I also want to know, um, did you have any any um, apprehension about going to, you know, uh, what was known as such a violent yard? Uh, no, I didn't know what to expect on the yard. Um, but what I did know is everybody that mostly went to the shoe um got released to that yard and back then um if you was on b yard then everybody knew you've been there for a stabbing or something mostly you know what i'm saying um it was very few people there just for a knife but uh, you went there you had some um a lot of lifers you know was there you know uh it was um it was a real awakening experience back then because um, they had the weights back then, you know. So that played a part because you had some dudes with motors, you know, doves, 22s and all that, you know, swole, you know. So uh, it was a lot going on. And so when you say you had dudes with doves and motors, for those, once again, who are not familiar with the California terminology, a, a dub is a 20 inch arm, you know, uh, so that's what he's that's what he's talking about. So what was it like to see some of those dudes, you know, some of those crips, some of those bloods uh, that big? I wanted that. I needed that. You know, um, I had a homie uh, that was there um, and he laced me on you know, um, ways to do it, ways to be on that line and carry myself, ways to work out, where to work out. Because um, back then, with the weight pile, um, the blacks was right next to the whites. And then on the other side of the whites was um, the Southern Mexicans, you know. Um, so you real close. It's not like the weight pile was very big. Uh, you close. And uh, like I said, um, with seeing cats with size and stuff like that, you know, the, the blacks was the biggest in there, you know, and you had cats throwing on like four or five quotas, you know, um, benching with no problem, clowning, right. you know, uh, and uh, a lot of other races um, took that as the blacks flexing. You know, so you've seen it, but they, they still couldn't still couldn't handle it like that. And so how long how long do you think you was on that yard before you seen something, you know, extremely violent or uh, some type of violence that made you realize, you know, OK, it's real up here? Uh, let me see. I think the first incident. That I seen was uh, 
the Southerners taking care of their own. Um, for, you know, whatever the reason was, I can't say, but uh, I just know I seen him on the bars and they hit him while he was working out on the bars, you know. Um, I seen also uh, and, 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 play. and so for clarification real quick. So when you say they hit him, you're talking about he was he was uh, he was stabbed with a weapon. He was stabbed up, uh-huh. stabbed up, red shirt portfolio. Right. And so what's, what's it like, though? I mean, OK, so at that time, you were a full fledged gang member, you know, and so um, seeing something like that, does it does it bother you in, in any type of way as far as just knowing that, OK, this is a serious place. I can lose my life up here. Or were you used to seeing so much violence that it didn't it didn't phase you? It didn't. This was my first first go around on the pen. This is the first main line I had been on for so long. You know, I think the coldest thing I might seen, man, is uh, a brother, um, he resting, um, Mad Dog, um, got into a situation up there. It's a Crip on Crip thing, man, and uh, he ended up on the bottom stabbing another cat up, and uh, I'm on the basketball court, man, and I'm look, I look right up at the tower. And it's like I said, it seemed like slow motion. I seen him aim and say, get down and shoot at the same time. And I watched his his braid blow off. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it was almost a big riot with the police behind that because you had a lot of blacks hollering, saying, hey, man, y'all didn't have to kill him and all that, you know, Um but I was like, wow, this is its own, you know. And and so that was back in a time, 1990, let's say what, six, ninety-four, somewhere up in there when when like uh this might have been ninety-five, almost ninety-six or something like that. I can't recall actually um <laughs> the year which one of the things I got out the shoe in ninety-four. So I know I had been there a little bit. Um, so it was like 95 sometime. And and so, yeah, that was back at a time when all California prisons, the level fours were extremely serious. There was no warning shots. And so you went on to describe an incident between two crips. Where one crip was stabbing the other and the guard uh, in the tower shot and killed him. I actually had another guest on here, uh, OG Chances. And he also was there when that happened and described that situation. So when you see when you're where when you're on a yard when you know it's violence, you know that as a crip, you're gonna be violent if the situation calls for it. And also knowing that there is a gunner that's gonna shoot and kill. You know, how do you go through all that knowing that you might have to go out and stab somebody and you possibly could be shot and killed? Well, I'm gonna say just speaking from my experience and my situation, um the guard in the tower ain't even in the thought. You know what I'm saying? It's all about the mission. It's all about um, getting in where you fit in with that tool, you know? So I never paid attention to the tower when it was my time to go. And so is there is there anything else that you've seen at Pelican Bay that, that uh, sticks out in your memory? Uh, on that trip, no. No. Uh -huh. And so, so you, you say, you say on that trip, so you, you ended up going back to Pelican, Pelican Bay at some point in time. I went to Pelican Bay again, uh, later on down the line, um, ended up back on B yard, you know, um, went there, um, for an assault, you know, um, end up knocking the dude out, um, putting Dayton's on his mouth, you know, wired him up. And uh, end up going to the shoe for that. And so, if if you can elaborate a little bit on that situation, what was what was that? Uh, what was that behind? Um, a bunch of mouth running, running that mouth. Uh -huh. You know, um, how cats cats be, and then we was from opposite sides without going into it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, right. So the the rhetoric, you know what I'm saying, was not tolerated. Right. And so 
what's it like, you know, okay, so being from, you know, being from A-Trade Gangsters, when you encounter somebody from, from uh, a set that you don't get along with in prison, is, is that stuff left in back in the county jail and left on the streets or how does that, you know, how does that work? Um, it, it changed over the years. Cause I remember, um, when I first went to the pen, it was different. Um, you didn't turn down the crib coming in the cell, no matter where it was. From. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, even at Pelican Bay, um, I had a homie that was in the cell um, at that time with a nine up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so uh, back then, you didn't turn down no crips, um, and you only sailed up um, with blacks. You know um, your own race back then too. You know, different from what I hear it is now. So, so back then it was much more crip unity and crip uh, camaraderie. It was, um, it was, um, you never really seen no cars get into it because a cat going to take care of his own, um, before the situation even go that far, uh -huh. you know, um, it was rules, it was rules and regulations to that. And you most definitely couldn't bring no county jail stuff to the pen, you right. know, it would be more at fault whether you right or wrong on the situation or not, you really can't do it you right. know um i ended up in a situation um the second time i went to pelican bay and i felt like life had tapped me on the shoulder and um gave me a chance to look at where i want to put my life and uh so i ended up being there with a guy that was on the case for killing my oldest son, Dejan. And uh, it's crazy because my son was a blood, a Damo. And this guy that's on the case was a crip, you know, a gangster, you know. Um, and this dude ended up being there with me. I didn't even know, you know. Um, I got a letter saying that, hey, the guy that, Kill Data is up there and you know he's in your building, stuff like that. So once okay, I let me, let me let me let me stop you right here before we get before we get too far, right? So um you said that you had a son pass away. Right. And your son, even though you're a crip, your son happened to be a blood. Um let me ask you. So when you first learned your son was a blood, how did you how did you feel about that? didn't bother me uh knowing how the streets are um, um a lot of time uh people end up from different sets just because of where their parents choose to move right. you know so um it ain't on the child because uh my oldest kids um for maybe the first two three years of their life um grew up right there on 82nd and normandy in my hood you know what I'm saying? But later moved out, you know, into the valley and ended up being from, you know, a blood hood, you know. And so by you being a father who was also a gang member and by you growing up in an era where gang banging was extremely serious, did you ever have talk with your son and try to deter him from from being a gang member? Um, I tried through in a letter. Like I said, I was in the pen uh, most of the time when my kids was growing up. Um, I thought, you know, growing up um, that when I was out um, giving the money, popping up for the birthday party and certain holidays and stuff, when I was out, I was being a responsible parent. You know, I didn't I didn't know how to be a parent. Uh, my first child came when I was 17. You know what I'm saying? And uh, my son was, uh, when my son was born, I was 18. <coughs> so I'm learning how to be a parent of uh, freestyling. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, but the streets was my first love. So they never got the appropriate attention 
um, like they should have been getting. Right. And so you you had told me previously that um, when your son got killed, your oldest son, you you are at the time incarcerated and you see it on the news, but you don't even realize that it was your son. Right. So, uh, you know, I watch the news a lot all the time. And it was a uh, five o'clock news. And uh, what caught my attention on this is crazy, man. But this is how, you know, programmed that we are um, in this gang life. Anytime I see the number 83 or the three, it draws my attention to it and I peep it. And it's crazy because I seen this thing. It said after school shooting and the ambulance that I seen this young kid getting put in had the number 83 on it, you know? Um, so I'm looking at the news. I see on the gurney, um, a youngster on there with his shirt off, you know, and then putting him into the ambulance. And I seen a young girl right there by the police. I seen another lady running down the street and all this. And I'm like, wow, it's, going on not knowing this is my kids wow. you know and uh so i seen the guy from the valley at chow hall because we went to chow right after that and i'm like man uh oh they out there shooting out there in that valley you know and i'm like uh i think my kids go to that school too you know and you know me and the dude chopped it up for a minute and stuff like that so the next morning and just just real quick briefly right for those who don't know the valley is a certain part of of southern california right it's not it's a uh, san gabriel valley uh yes like van nuys area <clears throat> okay and so that's so for those who don't know that's what he's talking about so sorry to sorry to interrupt yes so uh the next morning um i'm at work um i worked in the boot factory and uh the guards came like 10 of them came and scooped me up you know i'm thinking i'm in trouble but they ain't cuffing me though they just like follow us you know so they take me to the office and the captain is right there the captain said uh i got a phone call from your mother so i'm like man what's going on you know and uh I could hear it in my mom's voice when she had first thing she said is uh promise me you won't trip. And I paused for a minute and it kind of hit me this scene. I said, uh, was that day day? And she said, Yep, he died in the hospital. Mm, sorry to hear that, homie. You know, um, but I'm in the pen, you know, um, there's nothing I really could do. You know, I was, uh, 34 at the time, mm -hmm. you know? And so, uh, it was a, a real, um, awakening experience, you know? Um, I didn't know by who yet, you know what I'm saying? And then I finally got a call. And I was able to call my daughter because my son was there um, protecting his sister and her friend, right. you know, and uh, with doing that is end up how he ended up getting killed, you know. And, and so let me ask you to elaborate on. So at what point in time do you find out and realize, you know, that also was your daughter? Because you told me you had <coughs> you told me on the news. You happened to see her, but you didn't realize it was her. You also had seen her grandmother running down the street. When do you, so when do you realize that, okay, that's who that was? And, and at, at what point do you realize that's who everybody was? When I talked to my daughter the next morning and she's telling me the best she could on uh, who it was as uh, far as what hood and all that, you know. Wow. And so um if you can describe a little bit of what is what is that what is that mental anguish like, you know, when you're locked up in prison 
you lose a loved one, much less your son, you know, much less a, a child, you know, and like you say, you're in prison where it's a place where, you know, um, unfortunately, we don't like to seem weak and vulnerable in front of other people. And so how do you, how does a person deal with something that tragic? That was hurtful, man, because uh, I wasn't a father. I never was a father. I never was a dad to my son. Right. Wow. I never gave him that opportunity to know what it feels like to really be with your dad. Um, I spent time with him. Um, you know, um, later on, but I never was a, a good dad, you know? And, and so what was you guys' relationship like? Were you guys close? Did he have any, did he have any like regrets or resentments due to the fact that you was in and out of prison and in and out of his life? Or, uh, how was you guys' relationship? We exchanged a couple of letters, um, but it wasn't no, it wasn't no real tight relationship. Uh, he expressed his anger um, with, you know, the situation with me being in the pen and him being out there and stuff like that. You know, you go on to tell me at some point in time, you happen to be in the same prison. And you get a letter saying the person who is responsible for your son losing his life is there. And you, I think I cut you off before you mentioned not only is he there, but he is also the gang that he's from has an alliance with your gang. And you guys chill and hang together on the yard. Right. Uh, so by him uh, falling up under that gangster car, it was easy for me to get in contact with him. And uh, meet up with him because uh, at the time we was on lockdown. So uh, I met up with him at the law library and told him, man, I need all your paperwork, you know. Uh, and he shot it to me. You know, he had no no choice, um, especially once he found out who I was and that was my son and stuff like that, you know. And, and so let me let me ask you, let me ask you. Well, OK, if you if you can give us a little bit more how he happened to how he happened to pass away on that day. What was because he wasn't he was out of school. What? Why was he at school? You know, what was he doing at the school? Um, from my understanding, he was there to <laughs> pick my daughter up from school. Um, I think she had some problems with some guys or something like that. Um, I'm not sure fully on the whole situation on how that came about but i know he was there like to pick uh my daughter up after school and um they came across those dudes at the intersection and stuff like that and i was told that um my son um told them you know let's go across over here and take that fade you know and uh when they started going across the street, um, I was told my son got off first and started barking at them with that thing. And my daughter was in between um, her brother and them. And luckily, she didn't get shot, you know, uh, being in that crossfire. And uh, her friend, uh, from what I was told, um, ducked and ran behind the car at the intersection. And my son went up um, to try to save her, get her, and he ended up getting hit with a ricochet bullet. You know, I found out later that it was a ricochet. Right. And so and, uh, to make it a little clear for those listening, if they happen to be lost, your son, who is who who was a blood at the time, he confronted some Crips. Some Crips, two Crips. He right. was by himself um, with my daughter and her friend, and the, the two Crips was right there. And so initially upon learning that you and this individual are now on the same yard, when you first hear that, what was your initial thoughts once you get off the phone and you realize, okay, this guy is up here? What was you initially thinking? How did you feel? Uh, it's home. 
his song. But I'm older at this time. And uh, you know what I'm saying? There's certain ways that you gotta handle things too. Uh, so like I said, I got this dude paperwork. Um, me and the homie that's resting right now, um, Big L Mac, was in the cell together. And we had it, the paperwork out like a straight CSI investigation, you know. Um, I got to read all the testimonies everybody got on the stand, um, the detectives. That's how I found out that the bullet that killed my son was a ricochet and all that, you know. Um, but what I also found out is the guy that was there, um, when my son started shooting at them, this dude shot up in the air and ran, you know, uh, and the bullet that killed my son wasn't from his gun, uh -huh. you know, and so I was put in a situation to where I had to think rational or irrational. Um, do, do I get led by what I feel people going to think or do I get led by my own decision, you know? So, uh, so the homie, uh, tell me, you know, they talking about opening up the yard. We're going to go to the yard with them cats. Uh, we're going to holler then, you know, um, let me know what's up. So I say, okay, well, when we go to yard, we'll see. Um, make sure we send a kite and tell them cats to come to the yard, you know. Uh -huh. So we we go to the yard and the homie like, uh, you know, what's up? The homies want to know what's going down. I said, well, let me take a lap. Uh, when I take that lap, man, I feel like I'm being watched by the world, you know, because everybody know, you know, hey, this cat is in here, you know, he on that case about my son and stuff like that. And uh, I'm walking around, man, and uh, everything is going through my head with me and the homies talked about this dude paperwork and everything, his position that he played. And so it was like, you can't be mad at a cat for being there with the homies when the situation occurred because that's how he's supposed to be. He there with the homie. Uh, you only could be mad about his actions. You know, um, whether or not he shot or something like that. Uh, by it being exposed to me that this cat um, gun wasn't even the one that shot my son, uh, made it to where I had to really think. And like I said, I'm dealing with thinking rational or rational. Um, the rational side was like, man, forget that. This dude was there with that cat, you know what I'm saying, to kill Day Day and all that. It don't matter. Then I got this rational side, like, man, it wasn't even that dude. This dude shot up in the air and ran. And now that this is no, he got to deal with that too. That's coming to him too. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I made it around, man, back to the homie. And the homie said, What's up? I said, well, you read the paperwork just like I read the paperwork, man. That dude didn't even shoot him. And he said, yep, so what's your decision? I was like, I can't uh, I can't take it out on him just because he was there. You know what I'm saying? If I do, then I'm just crashing out. You know, and he was like, hey, that's your decision. I feel you on it. And so uh, I looked at that dude, man, and I could see the Man, his eyes was bigger than street lights. You know what I'm saying? He was shook. And I just looked at him and shook my head, man, and uh, walked another lap with the homie, man. And uh, maybe about not even two weeks later, man, I do end up rolling it up off the yard anyway. Uh, his celly said he didn't feel comfortable with being there and all that had went on, you know. So he ended up rolling up and going to, a yard over there and the homies end up dealing with him on a yard, you know, so. And, and, and so let me ask you, so initially upon finding out that he was there, right. And so then you, 
you send a kite and you tell him, you know, meet me at the library. And so when you first approached him, and so by this time he knows who you are, he knows that he's in prison um, on a case that led to the murder of your son. Is is he extremely nervous? What is his what is his vibe like? You know, when you tell him, hey man, I need your paperwork, I want to know what's going on, because he obviously has to know that when you give him the paperwork, you're gonna read through it and possibly his life is on the line. So what is what did you sense? How was he feeling? I never knew how this dude looked until we got to the law library. And uh, once I, I seen him, this was a kid. You know what I'm saying? This dude was 19 years old at the time. And uh, yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm freshly conditioned, worked out, big and everything. You know what I'm saying? Uh, hell yeah, he was nervous. Um, and, and so, excuse me, when you say he was a kid, if you can, just give us a, a basic idea of, of his of his physical characteristic. Was he 5'10", you know, 120, uh, 5'9"? Uh, describe him if you, if you this can. Dude, this dude was 5'2", man, and about a buck 45. So you he, know. Didn't, he didn't have no win whatsoever. He didn't have not a win, period, nowhere. 5'2". Five 5'2". Two. Five two. You know. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I seen it, but you know that that that's not here or there. You know I need to see that paperwork, right. and I got the paperwork. You know what I'm saying? We sat up there and chopped it up a little bit, man. And uh, I asked him, you know, tell me your side of the story, and he was honest about shooting up in the air, running. You know, um, he wasn't the one. I kept trying to tell him, man, what's your homie name that that did it? He wouldn't tell me, you know. He said, "Man, you know I can't do that, man." I said, "Oh, you can, you can." Yeah, he wouldn't do it, you know. I could say that. Um, he kept that part to himself, you know. Um, <coughs> so did did his homie, uh, <coughs> who was actually responsible? Did he did he get did he get convicted as well, or that he was never apprehended? Oh no, they both got caught. Um. They had 47 to life, mm -hmm. you know, for that one, you know, that was some gang bang stuff, you know, so they had gang allegations and all that. And then, and then, so once again, uh, for those who don't know, um, this dude, he happened to be on a different yard, right? But until you got that phone call or, or that letter from your family, letting him know, letting you know that he was there, you guys, your gang and his gang, you guys share an alliance. So had he been on the same yard as you before the letter, you would have embraced him as a homie, not knowing who he was. You Basically, what I'm trying to let everybody know is you guys run together, right? Normally, under normal circumstances. Exactly. Right. You know, um, his set fall up under the gangster car. And uh, everybody know how I go, you know, uh, with the gangsters inside the pen. The A-Tray gangsters is there, you know. Uh, Cats is going to fall in. You know what I'm saying? And uh, get a homies that respect, you know. So um, automatically, yeah, you know, he fall up under that gangster car. I'd have been hollering at the young cat trying to lace him and all that, not not even knowing, you know. Uh, but he ended up writing my kids' uh, mother or grandmother, um, letting them know his stance on it, how he apologized and, you know, how it wasn't him. And all that, you know, and that's how I end up finding out this dude, because, you know, in Pelican Bay uh, and I'm in uh, six block at the time, you know, it's a uh, it's sectioned off. So going through the lockdown and at this time, it, it was the blacks and whites was going at it with each other. So we on lockdown. So we ain't even getting that much yard. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's a whole nother situation. But um, you you don't know who they're with you if you ain't if you ain't on the same uh, tier as a cat and they letting out all the bottom tier or all the top tier from each section, you know. <coughs> right. And and so you say so. Eventually, the get the best way to put it is his nerves got so bad that even though. He's seen that you guys gave him a pass that day. 
He just didn't feel comfortable because that's the, you know, that's the horrible thing about being in prison, especially, and, and, and luckily I've never been in that situation, but I can only imagine. And I've seen individuals who, you know, they know they, I have seen individuals who know they are in some type of trouble with, with their particular gang organization, clique, what have you, right? And, and they're on pins and needles as these decisions are being made, because now, you know, they've seen it before, you know, it's, it's going to be one of your homies that gets you. So I guess this dude's nerves got so bad to the point where he just couldn't sleep because he, I'm assuming, like you said, that I'm assuming that he's in the cell with another homie, another homie from an, another, another crip from the gangster car, you know? And so right. he's not knowing that when he goes to sleep, is is his is this Selly gonna get him? So eventually his nerves got bad and he just couldn't he just couldn't operate and function on on that yard. So he rolled up and he went to another yard and and even though you chose to make the decision that okay this dude you know I don't feel he was responsible enough for me to do something to him. He got to another yard and your homies just being your homies and some of them may not even have known you. But like no we not. We're not accepting that. We don't care what the homie said over there. We just to get this dude just out of the love and understanding, you know, just having compassion and having empathy. So they 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 chose to get him, huh? Well, it's like this. Uh, his celly was from the valley as well. Uh, <coughs> his celly didn't even know his case like that until I asked for the paperwork and sent it back. You right. see what I'm saying? Uh, that, and and that's something too. Not, not to journey off and off the subject, but that's the difference. Of when I was first coming up, uh, when you hit the pen, everybody showed their paperwork. Uh, when you go in the cell with a cat, um, you exchanging that paperwork to make sure that you ain't in there with no cat that's foul, or you know, a cat ain't foul that's coming up in there with you. So his celly didn't even read his paperwork. But afterwards, then that's when it got funny between them because now his celly know that, dude, you ran, you shot up in the air, you know, all this whole weird ass stuff, you know. And and so, you know, that's another thing, Box. And I'm glad that you I'm glad that you. You mentioned that without even me asking, you know, because and I, of course, you know, you have a lot of these other YouTubers, of course, everybody's going to have pride in their where they're from. And especially their race, right? So I don't know how much you keep up with YouTube, but you have other races who often try to put a bad rep on the blacks and say the blacks don't check paperwork. The blacks will allow anybody on the yard. So in your era, and me and you are around the same age, when you was going to to prison, they was checking paperwork. Uh, mandatory. You better have your paperwork. You better have your paperwork, bro. Because if not, uh. You like to have a situation knowing, you know, you are going to have a situation, you know, and uh, what no blacks let anybody on the yard and all that wasn't none of that. And like I say, uh, when I was coming up, I could say um, my first home <laughs> to the pen was in Roscoe and I only stayed there for one week and a couple of hours on GP Pelican Bay is the most. Uh, time I did on the main line because once I left D yard, end up going to Lancaster and stayed there about eight months and then parole. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't really uh get to do no time nowhere but to where it was real cats, you know what I'm saying? That was really in the pen for doing stuff, not like nowadays where you could just go to the pen for anything. Um, and you wasn't on B yard at that time unless you really been through something. So paperwork was really checked out over there, you know.